the people making Colorado's laws do the safety dance to get around citizens who might want to try to stop new laws. And they do this all the time. I'll ask Bernie Sanders what happens to the 90,000 Coloradans he thinks need to find new jobs. And we'll discuss whether democratic socialism works out west. We remember a pioneer of sorts who brought generations of Coloradans into the world. Her legacy continues. And our state's top elections officer says, whoops, for something she said here on Next. There's this little trick used by state legislators, a way to change our laws quickly and to keep citizens from blocking new laws that they don't like. It's called the safety clause, and it's applied to about half the new bills at the Capitol each year, like the death penalty repeal that's about to pass. Let's be honest on that one. Colorado is not about to execute anybody anytime soon. So why does that repeal need a safety clause? Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. The repeal of the death penalty gets another hearing tomorrow at the Capitol. You can shoot as many people as you can. Everybody gets the same penalty. Despite the pleas from Democratic State Senator Rhonda Fields, the repeal passed the Senate. It's about to go through the motions in the House where it will pass. And it will pass with a familiar section in the text of the bill, a safety clause, meaning the General Assembly determines and declares that it's necessary for immediate preservation of public peace, health, or safety. But not necessarily your safety. The public safety of whom? of the people potentially charged with the um, death sentence. Democratic Representative Jenny James Arndt is the House sponsor of the bill and defended the safety clause by pointing out to me people have been exonerated after being given a death sentence. So yes, I do think that there is a public safety element here. Last year, one of her bills did not have a safety clause. She co-sponsored the national popular vote bill, the one that would change how Colorado participates in voting for president by giving our electoral college votes to the candidate with the most votes nationwide. That had a petition clause, which basically says the public gets 90 days to collect more than 124,000 signatures to put the issue on the ballot for voters to decide. And as you know, that happened. It didn't fit the definition of a safety clause. It had nothing to do with the public health and safety and immediacy. Well, Colorado must really be unsafe because lawmakers ask for it often. Last year, 46% of the bills had a safety clause. In 2018, 44%. In 2017, 45%. Just because a bill has that safety clause doesn't mean the voters can't stop it from happening. It's just more difficult. It's almost an automatic thing. You've got 90 days to collect the signatures. If it has a safety clause, you have to go through the trouble of going to the Secretary of State's office, requesting a title for something that can show up on a ballot, go through a lot of approvals, and it's just a, a chaos in a way. Mm -hmm. From 1930s to 1997, it was automatic until the leadership in 1997 said no. You're going to have to ask for permission for a safety clause first. So now they just walk in half the time and ask for it. Half the time they do, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marshall. Senator Bernie Sanders is making powerful Democrats nervous, and he's making progressives excited, often in the same sentence, like during his rally before a huge crowd in Denver last night. Before he took the stage, Sanders and I sat down for a conversation. Colorado has a higher concentration of traditional ener energy workers than most states. Uh, you've called for a ban on fracking in 2025 and then a transition for those workers into other careers. Correct. We're talking about about 90,000 Coloradans and their families. How exactly do it work? Those workers are not my enemy. And that's why in the proposal that we have brought forth, there are billions, billions of dollars in a just transition to make sure that those workers have income for five years, job training, education, health care. So those workers are not our enemies. It's not their fault that climate change is threatening the planet. So we're going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, they can get other jobs. But we're not going to push them aside. Uh, we are going to protect them. There are Coloradans and others across the Western U.S. who like to see themselves as self-reliant. Is the Western ideal of self-reliance compatible with democratic socialism? Yeah, absolutely. Look, what I believe is that the United States has got to join many other countries around the world in making and guaranteeing to people certain basic rights. All right, now you may disagree with me. I think health care is a human right. I think the right to get an education through college or trade school is a human right regardless of your income. I think the right to turn on your water faucet and make sure that the water that's come out is drinkable is a human right. The right, the need to retire with dignity is a human right. That's what I believe. You know what I think? I think most Americans agree with that. President Trump has a history of casting doubt on election results that he doesn't like. 
uh, he falsely claimed that millions of people voted illegally in 2016. Correct. Do you have any concern that he might try to stay in power if he loses in 2020? Well, then you're talking about, you know, obviously a very, very dangerous moment in American history. So at this point, uh, what we are trying to do, and I believe we will succeed, is bring millions of people together to engage in the strongest grassroots campaign this country has ever seen. You can see my full unedited discussion with Senator Sanders on the next YouTube channel. We've invited all of the Democratic contenders, as well as President Trump, to have similar conversations with us as they come through Colorado ahead of the March 3rd primary. Former Vice President Joe Biden is in Denver tonight for an expensive fundraiser. His team declined to have him speak with me while he's here. We're getting some feedback about ballot confusion caused by the Secretary of State's comments here on Friday. It sure sounded like Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold said that unaffiliated voters who get both parties' ballots are supposed to mail back the one that they do not use. We were incredulous about that. You were incredulous about that. And after next aired, the Secretary of State's office said that wasn't what she meant, and they apologized for the confusion. Just destroy that extra ballot you don't use. You know, do exactly what you already plan to do. It is not just Republican sheriffs in Colorado who openly disobey laws they don't like. Did you see Democratic Governor Jared Polis in the pit bull last night? Some dark, dark shade thrown by the governor as he posed with a pit bull puppy at the governor's mansion in Denver, posted the photo on social media. The city of Denver, where Mayor Hancock just on Friday vetoed a repeal of the pit bull ban, saying that those dogs are dangerous. It would appear that the governor disagrees. Hancock's response to his fellow Democrat on Twitter was simply, wow. This is Twitter, and the goal is to be petty, so somebody tried to bring the pit bull to the attention of Denver police. This blew up to the point that the governor's office decided to issue a statement about it today, saying that it was intended as a joke, that while the governor might not agree with every local decision, he thinks the mayor is doing what he thinks is best. Police and animal control are not about to kick down the door of the governor's mansion and take that pit bull puppy. DPD shares jurisdiction with the governor's, of the governor's mansion with the state patrol, but this is really an animal control issue. And Denver Animal Protection tells us it does not get into the business of policing the breed ban with puppies. They only evaluate full-grown dogs. Guessing that you heard about the debacle that was getting to and from the outdoor AVS game at the Air Force Academy over the weekend. People lined up for miles and hours on I-25 and missing the game. The Academy blamed road construction. CDOT pushed back. Today, our Steve Steger found a bit of military intelligence that all of us could have used ahead of time. It was one of the best national anthems I've ever seen. For AV season ticket holder Mark Smith, Saturday's game was special. He served in the Navy for five years, which also gave him some perspective on what happened before and after the game. It was a military installation. Um, it wasn't designed uh, to get in and out easy. Stalled traffic, both entering and leaving the academy, made people late for the game and late to get home. The Air Force Academy blamed much of it on conditions along I-25 and emergency repairs on potholes. CDOT pushed back on that today, saying those repairs only took about 40 minutes, well before the rush to get into the stadium. I don't know if it was just because I was more prepared or had a contingency plan, but um, it made the experience great. More than 43,000 people packed into Falcon Stadium on Saturday, a stadium that is no stranger to big crowds. Last season, the Falcons' average home attendance was about 27,000, with 41,000 showing when Air Force played Army. Nothing compared to the record crowd for the Notre Dame game back in 2002. Because this could be up to 58,000 people and they all have to come here in car. The stadium doesn't even hold that many people anymore. I think it's getting blown out of proportion a lot. Um, it wasn't as bad as a lot of people are making it out to be. So I heard from several people on Twitter and via email yesterday who say it's pretty typical to have a long wait at Air Force Academy. I called around today to see if the Academy or the NHL submitted some sort of traffic management plan to some other agency. Doesn't sound like that was required. Though the Air Force Assistant Athletic Director says the Academy and the NHL sat down several times to discuss the plan for parking and for entry. Kyle. 
Steve, you were down there that night. You've, you're plugged into the hockey scene. You talk to a lot of these folks. Do you get the feeling like there will be changes made next time, or do you get the feeling that it's just like, well, them's the breaks? Well, it's going to be interesting to see if they even want to do an outdoor game here again. I did get the feeling from the Air Force Academy that they're looking at some of the things they did during this game, and they might make some changes to procedure in the future there. Now, whether or not that's ever going to happen, an outdoor game will ever happen at the Air Force Academy again, probably not. So we'll see. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, you and me, we went to the one at Coors Field a couple yeah. of years ago. That went off without a hitch. Yeah, and we also knew to, like, check out our seats beforehand to make sure we could actually see the ice. <laughs> we, we did we check did. that out, didn't we? Some All people right. paid a lot. A lot of money. <laughs> see nothing. All right. Thanks, Steve. A barrier-breaking doctor delivered thousands of babies inside her home. Now there's plans for a reunion. And where does the metro area end and the foothills begin? Where exactly would you draw the line? And this, yes, I would say this definitely crosses the line. Next. The melting snow is revealing line crossers all over town. Hey, as we said, there's no shame in, in not ending up between the lines in a snowy parking lot. But folks, you cannot just park on the sidewalk, not even when it snows. Have a little awareness. Uh, this SUV grabbed a spot outside the Jerusalem restaurant on Evans. This is great. You don't even have to walk around the side of the building. Just walk right in the front. You're on the sidewalk. Like this guy that we saw a couple of weeks ago, again, on a sidewalk, I think this was in the Capitol Hill neighborhood, somebody wrote in the snow on the side of this car, and unless the driver's name was Richard, it was really mean of them to say that to him. So not intending for this to become a sidewalk parking segment, but if you'd like it to be, email next at 9news.com or give us a shout with hashtag HeyNext. <laughs> It's Monday. That must mean time for another round of snow, and that's exactly what we have in the forecast tonight. It will be light after a day with chilly temperatures in the mid 30s. We're typically around 46 this time of year. The storm coming in in pieces. We'll get a little wave of snow tonight, a break tomorrow, another round on Wednesday, and then a nice warming trend heading into the weekend. In spite of the snow and difficult travel at times on I-70, there are no advisories for snow around the area. We're starting to see some of the snow fill in around the Boulder area. It'll move into Denver. Forecast models have us in that 
that one to two inch range by tomorrow morning with clearing after the morning drive. It'll be a cold day tomorrow and this is not a major storm, but timed where it could be impactful for those of you headed out early in the morning. So cloudy and cold tonight, a low of 18 inch or so of snow tomorrow clearing high 38. We have a little more snow in the forecast on Wednesday and then a nice warming trend sunshine with temperatures near 50 for Friday, Saturday and for Sunday. Our next question comes from a viewer named Mary Beth. She's new to Colorado and just wants to know what we mean when we say foothills versus front range in our forecast. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have a general idea, but where exactly would you draw the line? We asked meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen. Weather knows no boundaries. It doesn't always stay within county lines, between roads and highways, or even above certain elevations. But we meteorologists have to use boundaries to describe the probability of how the weather will impact you. Here are some of the main areas you'll hear identified in our weather forecast. The Metro, the Foothills, the Palmer Divide, the Northeast Plains, and the I-25 corridor. There are no official boundaries. It's not like you'll see a sign that says you're now entering the foothills, but this is how most meteorologists in Colorado define them. Most of the smaller mountains you see when you look west of Denver are the foothills, generally from 6,000 to 9,000 feet. There is a gray area between the transition of these boundaries, like Boulder, for example. This city is below 6,000 feet, but because it's tucked right up against the foothills, it will almost always come closer to the foothills weather forecast than it does the metro. There are many towns in these gray areas like Parker, for instance. While Parker is in the metro area, its weather comes closer to the Palmer Divide forecast. When you hear a forecaster say the front range, that is usually referring to our area as a whole. That's everything between the Northeast Plains and the Front Range Mountains. Meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen for next. She helped deliver thousands of Coloradans over the course of five decades while her peers shunned her. She didn't let that bother her and she did it anyway and she did what she needed to do to, do to take care of the, the, the people in need. That's next.
generations of Americans were born at home. 7,000 Coloradans were born in one home. It belonged to Dr. Justina Ford, the first African-American doctor in Denver. She began practicing in the early 1900s and kept at it for half a century. Her home is now the Black American Museum and Heritage Center. And the folks there want to find some of those Coloradans delivered by Dr. Ford. It's part of our Black History Month coverage. Our Byron Reed shows us the museum's plan for one big family photo. Here's my birth certificate. For Joseph Martinez, the meaning of strength. And here's a picture of me on a horse. It's kind of tattered. Is a lesson he learned as an infant and still carries with him today. Knowing about her and the, the struggles she faced and it didn't stop her uh, was amazing to me. Martinez grew up in the Five Points area and shared a connection with some of the kids in the neighborhood. I was born in 1948. He was delivered by Dr. Justina Ford, who over the course of 50 years... She was the first African-American female doctor licensed in Colorado. ...helped deliver over 7,000 newborns. And she was mentioned and I kind of triggered that, well, you know, I, I know who this lady is. She, uh, she delivered me. She actually applied to be a member of the Colorado Medical Society in 1902. And um, they refused her membership. She had two strikes against her. She was black and she was a woman. Sylvia Lamb is with the Black American West Museum and Heritage Center and says they're in search of former patients and people who are delivered by Dr. Ford. I think they're ranging from 70s to 80s. To capture a picture underneath her mural at 27th and Welton. Because some of these people may not be with us in years to come. And this is a great opportunity to memorialize. It's got Justina Ford's name on the, on the bottom. Martinez says it makes him feel good to be part of a legacy. She was a forceful woman and she was determined to, to do what her passion was. Of a woman who was strong enough to overcome. That's how Justina Ford was. And I think to me being brought into this world uh, by her, and I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> For next. That's, that's amazing, that's amazing. I'm Byron Reed. Museum staff will take this photo on Friday, 10 o'clock in the morning, during a dedication ceremony honoring Dr. Ford. Her home, the museum, is at 2701 Welton Street there in Five Points. I have not been tempted to go back to school in a long while, but then one school offered up a few of my favorite things today. That and your feedback next.
This is the time each night when we feature your feedback, and it comes to us from Colorado Mesa University in video form today. They want me to come hang out on the Western Slope and talk journalism, and they are under the impression that I can be bought. We need Kyle to come west. Let's help him. That appears to largely be alcohol. I'm concerned about the messages that I'm sending to the youth of today. Oh, there's a student newspaper. That's good. I don't know what that is. Is that honey or jam or something like that? That's fine. I'll take all of that. I appreciate their creativity and their persistence, and uh, we'll see if we can make a swing out to the Western Slope to hang out with some folks. We finish with your feedback tonight, and Eric writes in to ask if I plan to endorse a candidate, seeing that opinion is something that we do here. We should probably talk about this a little bit more. When we do commentary around here, it's about shared values like transparency or accountability or honesty. Don't advocate on policy. Don't tell you how to vote. That's your business. See you next time.